Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fifth meeting of the beer evaluation course. This time, we will discuss hops, boil, whirlpooling, and cooling. Just wanted to remind you that if you like the video, please hit the like button, and if you have any questions, please comment on the video, and I will answer. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please click the subscribe button and click the bell icon to get notified when my next videos come out. In addition, if you haven't followed me on my social media, you can see them changing on the screen right now or find them in the description below. And now, without further ado, let's get to our presentation of the day about hops and boil. This is the fifth presentation of the beer evaluation course about hops and boil. This is the layout of today's presentation. We will start by talking about the history of using hops, the hop plant anatomy and agriculture, important compounds in hops, hop processing methods, major hop families, the boil, using hops, whirlpooling and cooling, and we'll start with the history of using hops. The Humulus family first appeared in the Mongolian region at least 6 million years ago. The European species, Homulus lopulus, appeared at least a million years ago and migrated to the Americas half a million years later. It is not clear when hops began to be used in beer because its pollen and seeds are similar to those of the hemp plant. In archaeological excavations, many of the same pollen and seeds are found, but since the use of hemp to make clothes and ropes was very common, it is not possible to know whether it is hops or hemp. But what we know for sure is that in the 8th century AD, hops were used in beer and grown domestically in the gardens of monasteries in Europe. On the other hand, it is not really clear what was done with hops in brewing. The first evidence of boiling the wort with hops appears in writings only in the 11th century. Besides, the fact that brewers knew the benefits of making beer with hops doesn't mean that brewers actually used hops in beer. Most brewers continued to make beer without hops. Before hops, brewers would use groot to balance the beer. Groot was a mixture of herbs used to balance beer. Groot, or the herb mixture, was subject to regulation and taxation, with religious and secular authorities using it for revenue. But everything I've said so far has been in continental Europe. Beers with hops arrived in England as imports from Holland in the second half of the 14th century. And for decades, the English called beer without hops ale and beer with hops beer. The reason for the success of beer with hops compared to beer with root was mainly that it was possible to make beers with less malt that did not spoil. You don't need high alcohol content to prevent contamination. And if it was possible to make beer with less malt and less alcohol, that the public would consume a lot of them quickly because they didn't get drunk, and also because they were cheaper, brewers would prefer to brew beers with hops. In Munich, on the other hand, we see the adoption of hops a little later, until in the middle of the 15th century, it was already included in the laws of making beer. This was basically the prequel to the Reinheitsgebot. So, after we discussed the history of hops in brief, and when they started using it in beer, the question arises, why of all plants in the world, hops? So hops contribute seven things in brewing. The first, it adds bitterness that helps the brewer balance the sweetness from the malt. It also gives aroma and flavor to the beer. In addition, the alpha acids in the hops also give the impression of a fuller body and help maintain the head of the foam. And finally, the antibacterial properties help prevent the development of unwanted organisms as well as preserve the taste of the beer. After we discussed where hops came from and why are they used in beer, 
it's time to move on to talk about the hop plant and its agriculture. When we talk about hops, we talk about the species Homulus lopulus. Homulus lopulus belongs to the Cannabaceae family, which includes, among other things, the cannabis plant. Since the aromas of hops and cannabis are very similar, a linguistic connection developed between them, and many words that are used to describe cannabis are also used to describe hops, terms like dank, green, sticky, and more. If hops are propagated based on their seeds, the farmer cannot predict the plant's aroma and bittering compound's composition, because the genetics will be different from the mother plant. Therefore, as with grapevine varieties, if we want to keep the taste and aroma, we multiply them by clones. The clones in hops can be based on plant cuttings or on the basis of rhizomes, which are actually pieces of hop roots. Different varieties of hops differ from each other on the basis of aroma and taste, the alpha and beta acid content of the plant, the size and the shape of the flowers, optimal growing conditions, and yields. Now, let's talk about the growth cycle of the hops plant. The plant has three stages during the year. In the first stage, the plant is in a coma. This happens in the northern hemisphere between October and March. In March, the plant wakes up and begins the vegetative growth phase. At this stage, the plant sprouts and shoots appear above the ground. After that, more shoots are formed, elongate, and start to climb. In the next phase, that starts in the summer in June, the plant goes into the reproductive phase. At this stage, an inflorescence appears, and then the plant blooms. After the flowers are fertilized, cones develop, which mature and fill up with yellow material. When the cones are ready, the harvest comes. This happens in the North Hemisphere around September. After the harvest, the plant goes into hibernation again, and the cycle restarts. After talking about the different stages of the plant, let's talk about how farmers grow it. The hop plant grows between latitudes 35 and 55 degrees north and south. The problem is not the climate, but a matter of growing hours in light and darkness. Hops grow on a support system called trellis. This system consists of four meter high columns to which cables are tied. The hops farmer can choose whether to plant rooted cuttings or to plant rhizomes. In the spring, the hops field is prepared for planting by repairing the support system, installing irrigation systems, and tying wires from the trellis cables to the ground. There are super skilled workers who ride on ramps and tie these wires. After the preparation, the hops are planted and in March there is already initial growth. In the second stage, workers go through and select two to four shoots and tie them to the threads that are tied to the cables above. When the cones develop, the percentage of moisture in them is regularly monitored to determine when to harvest. After talking about the hop plant, we need to discuss the parts of it that really interest us as brewers and beer judges, the hop cone. So, first of all, the definition of the hop flower is not really a cone, but catkin. Catkins are clusters of small flowers and they appear mainly in the Cannabisae family, in hops and cannabis. In the beginning, an inflorescence grows which develops into catkins. The blossom develops on a zigzag branch located in the middle of the cone called a strig. This branch has pairs of outer leaves called bracts and quartets of inner leaves called bracteoles at each node. Between each quartet of inner leaves are the lopalin glands. Lopalin is a yellow, sticky, and aromatic substance. After we've gone through growing hops, let's discuss what happens to the hop vines after growing and we'll start with the harvest. The hops are harvested using combines 
that cut the plant from above and below at the same time. From there, the hops are transferred to the treatment plant. In the plant, the plants are transferred to a machine that removes all the leaves and cones from the shoots. From there, they go to a machine that blows the leaves with air, and that way only the cones are left. At this point, the cones go to the kiln for drying. Drying kilns are usually built from several areas inside giant sheds. These kilns are actually huge surfaces through which hot air is passed to evaporate the moisture from the hops. The cones are transferred to the kilns and are piled there to a depth of 60 to 90 centimeters. Hot air between 54 and 63 degrees Celsius is then pumped through the bottom to dry the hops within 6 to 8 hours. During the drying process, there are helical screws that turn the hops to ensure homogeneity in the drying process. If you remember, we saw a similar technique in the presentation on malting and the germination process. Basically, different varieties are spread to a different heights and dried at different temperatures, but we don't go into that here. As a rule of thumb, aromatic hops are dried at lower temperatures to avoid damaging the aromatic oils. After we talked about the hops plant, the hops cones, growing hops, the harvest and kilning, the next subject to discuss is the important compounds of the hops. The first and most important compound in hops in terms of beer are the alpha acids. These acids are the main ingredient in the lopolin, and we will always see their percentage of the weight indicated on the packaging of the hops. If this is not listed, don't buy from this vendor. It's really, really basic. Hops have three main types of alpha acids called humulon, cohumulon, and adhomulon. The problem is that these acids are not soluble in water and not really bitter. But when they are exposed to heat and kinetic movement from the boiling process, they undergo a chemical change called isomerization and become iso-alpha acids. These acids are four times more bitter than the alpha acids that have not undergone this process and are also soluble in water. When the alpha acids are isomerized, they are measured in International Bitterness Units, or IBUs. These units actually measure the dissolved iso-alpha acids in ppm. It is important to note that many divisions of hop varieties are based on the amount of alpha acids and not on the basis of flavors. The second important substance in hops are beta acids. Beta acids are a secondary component in the lopolin glands and their amount is measured as the percentage of the weight as well. There are three main types of beta acids in hops, lupulon, colupulon, and ad lupulon. Unlike alpha acids, beta acids do not undergo isomerization during the boil, but are evaporated. When hops age and oxidize, the beta acids turns into another substance called holopones, which actually undergoes isomerization and adds bitterness. Therefore, it is important to keep using fresh hops so that you don't get any surprises. The ratio between the alpha and beta acids in the hops can help us understand how much the bitterness of the hops will disappear as the beer ages. The third group of compounds is the group of aromatic or essential oils. These oils are the main component that creates the aroma of the hops and are usually between half a percent to three percent of the weight of the hop cones. The composition of these oils depends on the variety of the hops. The important oils are myrcene, which gives an aroma of green grass or resin, alpha humulone and alpha pinene, which gives an aroma of wood and pines, beta caryopylene, which also gives a woody aroma, and citral, citronenol, and limonene, which gives aromas of different citrus fruits. The big problem 
is that these oils are very volatile and evaporate during boiling. Therefore, you should add them at the end of the boil or during dry hop to save as much of them as possible. In addition, they are also lost while beer is aging. So you should drink beer with hops fresh. In addition to the good compounds of the hops, there are also compounds that we want to avoid in the beer. The first is isovaleric acid. This acid has the aroma of stinky cheese or sweaty socks. This acid is formed when alpha acids are oxidized. Because this happens relatively quickly, it's a good idea to smell each bag of hops before you add them to the beer to avoid stinky hops. If old and oxidized hops are used, for example, in Lambic, we know that three-year-old hops are used, the must must be boiled for several hours to evaporate this compound. The second compound is a skunk aroma. This happens when iso-alpha acids meet with UV rays that breaks them down. These fragments react with sulfur found in the beer and create a skunky aroma. Note that this can happen in a few minutes, so if you drink beer in the sun, you should put a hat on it to protect it from the sun. Now that we have talked about the important compounds in hops, we will move on to talk about how hops are handled after the drying process and the different forms in which hops are available to brewers. Let's start by talking about palletizing. To turn hops into pallets, the cones are passed through a cooled hammer mill to turn them into a powder. Cooling is important to preserve the aromatic oils. After that, the hops powder is transferred to a mixing tank in order to make it homogeneous. And from there, the powder is transferred through a dye in the form of a ring or a surface. Here, too, if the dye is cooled, we will get higher quality pellets with preserved aromatic oils. In this process, almost all of the lupulin glands are raptured and become 10 to 15% more effective. But, on the other hand, they oxidize three to five times faster. There are several types of hop products available to brewers. The first one is T90 pallets. This type of pallets has at least 90% green material. These are the most common pallets. But there is another type of pallets available called T45s. This type is basically enriched hops powder. The cones are milled at minus 30 degrees in order to separate the lupulin from the green material, thus concentrating its quantity in the powder. In most cases, it is made from strains that do not have a lot of alpha acids in them, so that there is no need to put a lot of green material into the beer to get the required bitterness. Another type of hop pellets are pellets that have been azomerized during the production process. While milling, magnesium hydroxide is added along with mild heat. Because the alpha acids are isomerized, only 10 to 15 minutes of contact time with the wort is required. The last type of pellets we will discuss is the so-called T100, or hop plugs. These are basically whole cones of hops that are pressed into plugs and used to add hops to casks in the UK. Besides pellets, there are also hop extracts. To produce hop extracts, a solvent, in most cases liquid carbon dioxide, is passed through a column of pellets and the resinous liquid is collected. The gas is then evaporated and only the resin remains. When such an extract is used, the hard resins and tannins, wax from the plant, pigments, water and other substances that are soluble in water are not coming to contact with the beer. Extracts are usually in the region of 35 to 50 percent alpha acids and 3 to 12 percent aromatic oils. The use of hop extracts lowers shipping and storage costs, gives a more uniform and stable flavor to the beer, and more alpha acids undergo isomerization. In addition, it lowers filter costs and the loss of wort absorbed by the hops. 
it is very, very profitable to use such extracts in beers that require a lot of hops in the recipe. Another type of hop extracts is iso-alpha extracts. These are actually extracts of iso-alpha acids that allows the brewer to correct the bitterness of the beer after fermentation. But they contain some beta acids and oils in contrast to other extracts. Raw hop extracts are extracts that contain dehydroiso-alpha acids. This type of isomerized alpha acids are not sensitive to lights and prevent the development of a skunky aroma, but they only have about 70% of the bitterness of normal iso-alpha acids. And the last type of hop extracts we will discuss is beta acid extracts and aromatic oils. These extracts are used to prevent foaming in the wort and also to increase the amount of aromatic oils in the must. In addition to palates and extracts, there are several other types of hops products. Tetra extracts that contain tetrahydroalpha acids also prevent the formation of skunky aromas due to UV light. But unlike rho hydro alpha acids, they are more bitter than regular alpha acids. For example, Corona and Miller use them to sell beer in a transparent bottle. Additionally, there are also hexa hydro alpha acids that do the same but have a similar bitterness to iso alpha acids. There are also many types of hop aroma products, both from the cones like Keef and in the form of extracts. These come both as extracts of mixed varieties and as extracts specific to a certain variety. After talking about the different forms of processing hops and the products available to brewers, we'll move on to discuss the major families of hop varieties. The first family is German and Czech hop varieties. In this family, there are four varieties that are also called noble varieties. These varieties include the Hallertau Mittelfru, which comes from the Hallertau district in Bavaria, Tettnanger, which comes from Tettnang in Germany, Spalt from Bavaria, and Saz from the Czech Republic. The reason that these varieties are called noble is because many hop varieties are their descendants. These varieties will usually have a subtle bitterness and a floral aroma, perfume, black pepper, and mint. Saz, specifically, has a subtle grassy taste and aroma. The second family of hops is the family of hop varieties that comes from England. Hops came to England in the 14th and 15th centuries by Flemish immigrants fleeing the Hundred Years' War between France and England. In England, the weather is very cold and wet compared to Belgium. Therefore, the hop varieties that developed to survive there are very different from their ancestors that immigrated from Belgium. Examples of these varieties include Goldings, Fuggles, Admiral, Brewer's Gold, and Northern Brewer. These varieties will usually have earthy, herbaceous, and woody and earthy aromas. The third family of hops are American hops or New World hops. Hops came to America with the English colonies in the 17th century. There used to be a lot of hops grown in upstate New York, but today the vast majority of hops are grown in the Yakima Valley in Washington, along with the Willamette Valley in Oregon. American hop varieties include the so-called sea hop varieties that include examples such as Cascade, Chinook, Columbus, Crystal, Citra, and more. These varieties are called that way because they have more aromas of citrus fruits than other aromas. In addition, there are many other varieties such as Galena, Glacier, Warrior, and more. These varieties will usually have an aroma of pines, citrus fruit, resin, dried fruit, and cat urine. After discussing the history of hops, the plant and its agriculture, the important compounds in it, the products that can be used, and families of hop varieties, we will move on to discuss the boiling process. 
The boiling process has seven goals in brewing beer. These are development of color and flavor due to Maillard defects, evaporation of unnecessary water to reach the desired volume, sterilization of the must, and destruction of bacteria and wild yeast, evaporation of all flavors, isomerization of alpha acids from the hops, extraction of oils from the hops for flavor and aroma, and finally, coagulation of excess proteins. The first four are a direct result of boiling. The rest require kettle additions by the brewer. Now, let's talk about each of these goals in depth. Let's start with Maillard effects. Maillard effects are chemical compounds formed from sugar and amino acids that are both found in the wort of beer. As a result of these compounds, the color becomes darker and a caramel flavor develops in a beer. The second purpose is to evaporate water from the must. If we have too low gravity after the sparge, we can concentrate the sugars by evaporating water. In addition, during the boiling process, bacteria and wild yeast simply denature and break down. The next issue is the hot break. Hot break means the coagulation of proteins and polyphenols during boiling. While boiling, proteins and polyphenols stick to each other and precipitate out of the solution. It looks like an egg drop soup. And at the beginning of the boiling, it looks like a grayish brown layer that floats over the wort. It also causes the formation of a lot of foam in the beginning of the boil. So the brewer has to pay attention when they reach the boil that there is no overflow. Usually, brewers will add carrageenan, or by its common name, Irish moss. Carrageenan is a type of algae that is positively charged, so proteins that are negatively charged stick to it. The brewer will add the Irish moss in the last 10 to 20 minutes of the boil to increase the coagulation process. The impact of this process on the beer is the prevention of haze and problems with flavor stability that are caused by too much protein in the final beer. In addition, if tannins and polyphenols are not removed, astringency will appear in the final beer. Now, let's talk about what is this isomerization I'm talking about. As I said in the beginning of the presentation, alpha acids are not really bitter nor they are soluble in water. To be soluble in water, they have to undergo a chemical process called isomerization, which also makes them more bitter. The isomerization process is a process that requires a lot of energy. As you can see, it involves the conversion of a hexagonal ring to a pentagonal ring. This energy comes from the boil, both in the form of heat energy and kinetic energy from the swirling caused by the boil. As a rule of thumb, at 100 degrees, in wort at the pH of 5.2, about 1% of the alpha acids will undergo isomerization every minute. After 60 minutes, the utilization of the alpha acids decreases so much that it is no longer worth boiling beyond that point. It is important to note that, unlike the alpha acids that undergo isomerization, beta acids and aromatic oils evaporate from the solution very quickly. So, if the brewer wishes to add them, they will add the hops close to the end of the boil or after the boil is finished. As I said, during the boiling process, we also remove off flavors. One of these is dimethyl sulfide, or DMS. This molecule contains sulfur and gives the aroma of canned sweet corn. The good thing is that this compound has a very low boiling point, so it is easy to evaporate it from the wort. Other descriptions of this substance include cooked vegetables, ketchup, milk, and seafood. DMS is made from a precursor called S-methylmethionine or SMM in short. SMM appears in the wort from the embryo of the malted barley. Since this compound has a relatively low boiling point, it evaporates 
during the malt kilning process. In Pilsner malt, because its lower kilning temperature compared to pale ale malt, it has eight times more SMM than pale ale malt. For this reason, when Pilsner malt is used, the boil should be longer to evaporate all the DMS. During the boiling process, above 60 degrees remaining SMM breaks and reacts with the sulfur found in the wort and turns into DMS. During the boil, it is evaporated from the wort. Therefore, at the end of the boil, the brewer strives to cool the wort as quickly as possible to stop the conversion of SMM to DMS. A good uncovered boil of 90 minutes will remove most of the DMS from the wort. One more topic I wish to discuss, mainly because it is popular in home brewing, is the so-called partial boil. The term full boil means that the entire volume of the boil is boiled and finally cooled. In partial boiling, a part of the wort's volume is boiled and afterwards the wort is diluted with ice to cool before fermentation. The impact of this method on the flavor of the beer is that the utilization of the hops will decrease so the brewer has to add more hops to get the same amount of bitterness. A faster development of color and also more caramelization will happen. And in addition, since a part of the water is not boiled, contamination of the wort after the boil can occur. So we went over the purposes of the boiling process and their effect on the taste of the beer. Now let's understand how hops are used in beer. The first use of hop is to boil it in the wort. At one time, from the beginning of the craft movement until 2017, it seems that brewers were just running wild with hops and adding it whenever they could in the process. This, of course, was accompanied by a lot of speculation and pseudoscience about what it gives to the beer and that beers made with the specific method they use contain characteristics that cannot be found in any beer made in any other way. In 2018, after the appearance of the first hazy IPAs and their scientific analyses, brewers realized that it was possible to add bittering hops and dry hop, and that's it. So where did brewers add hops? The first time the brewer can add hops is in the mash process. Not really boiling, but possible. In the boiling itself, it is important to understand that hops that are added at the beginning of the boil, meaning that they are in the boil for more than 30 minutes, will give mainly bitterness. Brewers usually add the bittering hops about 60 minutes before the end of the boil. When added at this time, most of the aromatic oils evaporate and most of the alpha acids undergo isomerization. In addition, Brewers claim that the addition of hops about 30 minutes before the end of the boil adds a flavor of the hops to the beer. What is true is that hops that are added in the last 10 minutes of the boil will add hop aroma. The closer the brewer adds the hops to the end of the boil, the more aroma will remain in the beer. The last hot stage where the brewer can add hops is in the whirlpool. Here, there is no boiling and therefore there is little evaporation of oils. After we've seen when brewers can add hops to the hot side, we will move on to talk about where you can add hops during fermentation. Adding hops to the fermenter during the fermentation process or to the cask is called dry hopping. The problem with hops aromatic oils is that they are so volatile that they can evaporate with the bubbling of CO2 during fermentation. In most cases, except in hazy IPAs, dry hopping is done after the initial fermentation to preserve the aromatic molecules. Dry hopping is a very expensive process, both because of the cost of the hops that has to be added to get the desired aroma, and also because of the beer loss due to hops absorption. In addition, too much hops or too much contact time with the beer will give the beer a grassy green taste 
called a hop burn. In hazy IPAs, additional dry hopping is done during the main fermentation. What happens is that the oils are transformed during fermentation by the yeast to give different aromas than normal dry hop. Of course, after adding the hops during the main fermentation, the brewer will add another dose of hops in the secondary fermentation as well. So, what are the effects of hops in beer? The good effects are bitterness, aroma, and taste of hops. The less favorable effects which brewers want to avoid are grassy, green, hop burn, isovaleric acid, skunky, and polyphenols that bring astringency. Now that we've talked about how hops are used in beer, we'll talk about how brewers create a hop profile for a beer recipe. As usual, the brewers start by understanding the style they wish to brew. In particular, they will understand how many IBUs they aim for in the final beer, what types of hops, and what is the percentage of the alpha acids in the hops they will use. They will then use an IBU calculator to calculate the bitterness contribution of each of the hop additions. Usually, they will start by adding 70% of the bitterness they want at the beginning of the boil and will add the rest with later hop additions. After they calculated everything, they will make sure that they are within the IBU range of the style and correct if they deviated. Now, after we've talked about the hop plant, the important compounds in it and the flavors they give, and how are hops used in beer and boiling, we will move on to discuss two more processes, the whirlpool and cooling. We will start with the whirlpool. The goal of the whirlpool is to separate the proteins and solids of the hops from the wort before transferring it to the fermentation process. In this process, the wort is transferred into the whirlpool tank through a tangential entry point that stands in perpendicular to the side of the vessel. This directs the flow of the wort along the side of the tank, creating a spinning liquid. When the tank is full, the brewer will let the liquid stop and the debris to sink for about 15 minutes. This process causes all the solids to concentrate in the center of the vessel, which has a conical bottom. Finally, the wort is pumped through an outlet that is above the solids at the conical bottom into the fermenter, leaving the solids behind it. In terms of the flavor impact this process can have of the final beer, if the separation is not good enough and proteins transfer into the fermenter, the yeast can metabolize them and create fusel alcohols. Regarding the equipment needed in order to perform this process, we need a vessel with a conical bottom and a tangential entry point that is in perpendicular to the wall of the tank to spin the wort. At the bottom of the conical bottom, there are two exits, one at the bottom of the cone to discard of all the protein and hops at the end of the transfer, and another one above the height of the proteins and hops to transfer the clean wort to the fermenter. Now, we will move on to the last process we will discuss today, which is the process of cooling the wort to a temperature where the yeast can be pitched. The goal in the cooling process is, as I said, to cool the wort to a temperature where the yeast can be pitched. There are two main ways this can be done. The first is to use a chiller or a heat exchanger. A heat exchanger works by moving the wort next to water or some other cooling agent while increasing their surface area. The increase in surface area will cause a rapid energy transfer, thus cooling the wort or heating of the cooling medium. In the second method, the brewer uses a cool ship. In this method, the must is transferred to a very wide and shallow pool called a cool ship and remains there during the night to cool. The increased surface area of the wort with the air causes a faster exchange of energy between them, thus cooling the wort. Since there is 
contact with the air, bacteria and wild yeast can enter the wort and begin to multiply. How does the cooling process affect the taste of the beer? If the wort is quickly cooled, what is called a cold break will happen. If you remember the hot break, which was the coagulation of proteins due to heat, then rapid cooling causes coagulation of proteins due to cold. This will help settle the proteins in the fermenter. In addition, as long as the wort is above 60 degrees Celsius, DMS continues to form. Therefore, we want to cool the wort as quickly as possible to below 60 degrees in order to stop the creation of DMS. As a rule of thumb, if the wort is kept for over 90 minutes above 60 degrees, there will probably be detectable DMS in the final beer. And of course, if the chiller is not clean and disinfected, or every time you use a cool ship, the wort will be inoculated with wild yeast and bacteria that will cause it to spoil quickly. As for the needed equipment, either a chiller or a cool ship. The last thing we will discuss today is no-chill, because it is a common method among home brewers. Why cool if you can just not cool? In this method, the wort is transferred to heat-resistant containers. So, if plastic is used, it is important to note that its type is heat-resistant. And after the transfer, the brewer will take out the air in the container and close it. Then, leave it all night to cool. It is important to note that the container will shrink because the wort shrinks and air is prevented from entering to prevent contamination. So, it is important to use an elastic container. The effect of this process on the beer is both a disturbance in the clarity of the beer because there is no cold break and also the appearance of DMS in the beer because the wort is left for a long time above 60 degrees. But, on the other hand, the necessary equipment is simply an elastic container that is resistant to heat. So it is much easier to do this instead of buying a heat exchanger. This is where we finish the fifth presentation of the beer course, about hops and the boil. I hope that the talk was informative and interesting, and I want to remind you that if you like the video, please hit the subscribe button, like button, and click the bell icon to get notified when the next videos come out. If you have questions, please write them in the comments, I promise to go over them. In addition, you can see my social media handles change on the screen or find them in the description of this video. You are welcome to follow me to know when my next projects come out. Thank you for listening. I was Omar Basha and see you in the next meeting where we will discuss yeast and fermentation.